Thank you, Pastor Don. And his band, God bless you all. Appreciate you leading us in worship. We're in Romans chapter 1. And Paul is already, as in his introduction to this uh, wonderful letter, has expressed that he is set apart for the gospel. Paul's writing some 20, maybe close to 30 years after he met Jesus on the way to the road to Damascus, and he was radically changed. And as I told you maybe a, a week or two ago, uh, when I was in Israel several years ago now, that uh, our, our Jewish guide, he really struggled with Paul because there was such a radical change. He said, how can someone go from hating the church, persecuting the church, and, and, uh, and speaking against the Messiah to be radically changed and be willing now to die for the Messiah? and to love and support and encourage and minister to the church of Jesus Christ. He said, this radical transformation is a puzzle to me. Well, we're not puzzled by it, not at all. Because when you trust Christ as your Savior and you meet Him and are met by Him, you are radically changed and transformed. Your life is never, ever the same. So Paul was set apart for the gospel. But he also said that when he wrote to the church at Rome, to believers, that they're also called of Jesus Christ. You and I are also set apart. And I don't know about you, but when I first became a Christian, you know, before that, I really didn't go to church that much. But when I first came, became a Christian, the first thing I wanted to do, I wanted to start going to church. I wanted to be around God's people and be encouraged by them and, and hopefully encourage them as well. And Paul was grateful for the church at Rome because he had heard of their faith and their ministry and their love toward one another and their love for the lost. And then in verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The same gospel that he tried to stamp out before. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For it is the righteousness of God, for in it, he says, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And Paul, it's almost as though it, you would be reading a gospel track. Because a lot of times when you read a, a, a track that uh, is written for the purpose of sharing the gospel, they first start out with the bad news. Showing that how we are all sinners and that we all need a Savior. And that's exactly how Paul begins to write in this letter to the church at Rome. He speaks about the righteousness of God, of God but he also speaks about the wrath of God. And that's where he starts. And the sinfulness of man. And all the way up through most of chapter 3, Paul is talking about the sinfulness of man. It concludes that there's none righteous that we have all gone astray just like sheep. And we're not seeking God. But yet by His grace, He sought us. And Paul wastes no time and he minces no words when he writes about the sinfulness of mankind and the darkness of our hearts. And listen to what he says then in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. You know, one of the greatest expressions of His wrath is in the universal flood. There was only eight souls that were delivered. Noah and his family. Noah, a preacher of righteousness. But God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and righteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. I heard someone say one time, there's no such thing as an atheist because within us is the knowledge of God. That you're not an atheist, you're just simply denying the truth. You're a liar. Everyone is accountable because that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them. And he explains 
this. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Folks, this did not happen. What we know as creation, heaven and earth did not happen, could not happen by random chance. There is a creator. There is one who causes this to be in existence. And much has been spent in time and money and effort to disprove that there is a God. And to willingly refuse to recognize that His eternal attributes, His power, His eternal power and His divine nature is clearly seen by what has been made. The order, the complexity, the beauty of it. Uh, years ago, when I was in college, one of my favorite courses was, was biology. Because uh, we, we studied the function of, of a cell. And just by studying a single cell, the order, the complexity, everything has a role within the cell. And the phospholipids around the cell. And what can go in and come out of a cell. And, and the, the energy, energy factory, the mitochondria, the energy factory of the cell and the Golgi bodies and all of that. To, that carries almost like a trucking, interstate trucking system within the cell. The, the cell moving that energy and um, the food to make that energy, moving it around back and forth. And then you have the endoplasmic reticulum and all of that compartmentalizes the, the chemical uh, uh, activity within the cell, protecting other parts that needed to be protected and, and all of this working together. The order and the, the creation, the complexity and the beauty of it. Um, I walked by uh, one of uh, my professors, Dr. Spahn, he was uh, a, a brilliant guy and uh, was one of my professors in biology. And I was walking down the hallway at college one day and he, he was looking through this little bitty hole in a machine that was, that was sitting in the hallway there. And I said, Dr. Spahn, what are you looking at? He said, come here, come here, come here. You got to see this. You got to see this. He said, look in there. And I looked in there and all I could see was a light. I thought, Okay, what am I looking at? What are you excited about? He said, that's mitochondria. And he, he was just totally, totally blown away by that. The beautiful order and complexity of just, just a single cell. To believe all of that that takes place by random chance. It takes a lot more faith to believe that this all happened by chance. I just don't have that much faith, folks. It, it takes a lot of faith to be an atheist. It really does. I don't have that much faith. I believe that God did exactly what He has revealed and said He did. Let there be light. He spoke the worlds into existence. And by His grace and mercy and kindness, He created all things. He spoke them into existence. Now, I do believe in the Big Bang Theory. But my theory is a little bit different. God said it, bang, it happened. Now, that's my theory of the Big Bang. God said it, bang, it happened. Since the creation of the world, it says, His invisible attributes have been clearly seen. His eternal power, His divine nature. And being understood by what has been made so that they are without excuse. None of us have an excuse. I, I, I just absolutely love looking at trees and, and the stars. And, and uh, Nicole and I, we, we take walks and we watch the different phases of the moon and the cloud configurations and the different colors and all this stuff. It's just, God is an absolute artist. He loves order. He loves beauty. Uh, he loves complexity. And w even we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And we who believe and understand that give God the glory for that. Professing to be wise, let's see, what, what am I doing here? There, there we go. Professing to be wise, they became 
fools. Now, this is not the wisdom of God, but the wisdom of man. Man trying to figure this out. And what's even worse, some think they figured it out. And don't have sense enough to, to know that they don't know. But professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of God, the glory of the incorruptible God, for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. You know, when I, when I read that verse, I, I think about when God brought the people of Israel out of Egypt. And brought them through the Red Sea on dry ground. He parted, he parted the water. They walked through on dry ground. Then Pharaoh's army in pursuit. God released the water. It came back and Pharaoh's army was destroyed. It was drowned. They saw the plagues, the ten plagues. Now, tomorrow night, uh, John Arthur, I think I've got my calendar right. Tomorrow night is Passover. Is that right? Tomorrow night. Yeah, it's sundown. It's Passover. And there are many that are going to be joining around the world, and maybe even starting now, but joining around the world, depending on what time zone they're in, uh, they're going to be going through what's called the Haggadah. It's the same. And they're going to observe a Seder, which the word means order. And, uh, and part of that Seder is the cup of judgment. And, and, as, and as part of the Seder, they will dip their little finger into that cup of judgment and then take their finger out and drop a little bit of that wine on a, a napkin or a cloth and they will name the ten plagues. They will name the ten plagues. That's the cup of judgment. First, they'll have the cup of sanctification, God setting them apart. And uh, then they will remember the plagues. And uh, Israel witnessed all of this. They witnessed the plagues. They witnessed the death of the firstborn. They observed the first Passover, and, and God passed over the home that had the blood on the doorpost and lintel. They witnessed all of this, and then went through the Red Sea, and Pharaoh's army destroyed. And then they, then they come to Mount Sinai, and they witness all of this at Mount Sinai. And yet they begin to grumble and complain and say, it's better that we go back. But even when Moses was in the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, when he came down, what had they done? They had made a golden image. They made a calf. This God who had delivered them, rescued them, and what did they do? They made something four-footed, an animal, and were worshiping it. It's amazing that this occurred. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling things or crawling creatures. I'm going to stop right there because this paints a pretty bad picture, doesn't it, of the heart of man. And you know, we were not born believers. There was a time when we did not seek after God. As a matter of fact, we never sought after God. God sought after us. And because mankind has chosen, and Peter says that they're willingly ignorant. In 2 Peter chapter 3, you can read that as part of your assignment this week. Quiz next Sunday. That he says that, they, that people are willingly ignorant. They deny what God has revealed of Himself. And even through creation, what we know about God is an expression of His grace, His mercy, and His kindness because He wants us to know Him. And He wants to know us. But man has responded in this way. But God responds in a way too. And that's verse 24. And the response of God, it says in verse 24, and I know I'm going to stop there. God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. I'm going to stop right there because this is, this is a part of a, uh, of a little introduction of next week. Because in a moment, we're going to celebrate with Alexis 
we're going to enjoy a wonderful baptism. But look at the heart of man. And they're, they, they did not reject God because their heart was darkened. Their heart was darkened because they rejected God. Let me say that again. They did not reject God because their heart was darkened. Because God has revealed Himself through creation and through His Word. And the author of Hebrews says in these latter days, through His Son. And even we were without excuse. But for those who habitually and continually reject God, their heart becomes darkened. So, they don't reject God because their heart is darkened, but their heart is darkened because they do reject God. There's an order to this. And we're going to see God's response to all of this. In these next verses through chapter 32 of next week, or verse 32 of next week, verses 24 through 32, we're going to complete this kind of stopped in the middle of this, this section. But we're going to look in detail of God's response to the hardness of man's heart and his willful ignorance. We're going to pause right now. And I want to ask you too, that never take for granted, but how's your heart? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Or are you still stubbornly resisting, unbelieving, trusting? Humble yourself. Look around you. Look at what God has revealed about Himself through creation, through His Word, through His Son, through His church. What God has revealed. Folks, God is shouting to us. Even in things that you have to look through a microscope to see. God is absolutely shouting. And I, for one, am completely excited about it. Still am. Still rejoicing. It just never gets old. And the more you learn and the more you discover, because I'm telling you folks, there's a lot more to learn and discover about God's Word and what He's revealed about Himself, because He's inexhaustible. And that's, that's the joy of learning and the joy of being a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ, is discovering. And there's a lot to be discovered. You can't exhaust an infinite God. So I'm, hope, I'm hoping you're as excited, as excited as I am about what God is continuing to do. He's still on His throne, still in control. He's still saving. Call on Him now. Let's pray.